The next item of business is debate on motion 12076 in the name of Keith Brown on the Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, may I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Keith Brown to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. It's uh, just over a year since the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers identified the importance of long-term patient capital in supporting economic growth. Uh, and building on this, we announced plans to establish the Scottish National Investment Bank in the 2017-18 programme uh, for government. The First Minister asked Benny Higgins, the former CEO of Tesco Bank, to lead the work on the case for Scotland having its own national investment bank. Uh, Mr Higgins' insight, commitment and vision has led to a unique and game-changing set of proposals. His plan sets out a clear vision of what a national investment bank can achieve and the practical steps that will be required in order to make that vision a reality. Uh, the Cabinet has been impressed with the breadth and depth of Mr Higgins' work and the advisory group he gathered around him. The prospect for a national promotional bank has therefore never been more certain. The First Minister made several important points when she received Mr Higgins' implementation plan on the 28th of February. First of all, the new bank should be a public body and it should operate independently within a strategic framework set by government. It should be mission-driven. It should focus on investment that isn't currently being provided by the market in a way that seeks to shape and to create markets. And it should address Scotland's economic priorities in an inclusive and ethical way. I can announce today that Cabinet has considered in detail the proposals outlined in Mr Higgins' plan and has agreed that the Scottish Government will accept all 21 of the recommendations made by Benny Higgins. I don't have time, presiding officer, to speak to all 21 recommendations here, but there are a few key points that I do wish to highlight. We, I believe, have made great strides in the economy, such as encouraging more ambitious start-ups and more companies of scale to provide the jobs of the future and to improve business expenditure on R&D. We've helped achieve higher investment in the rest of the UK and to help close the productivity gap. But we still lag behind comparator countries and there is considerable variation within Scotland. But since the financial crisis, finance for small and medium-sized firms has been in shorter supply. And that's had an impact on our economic growth before we factor in, of course, Brexit. Looking ahead, we need to be able to meet head-on the great challenges of the day, such as decarbonisation, demographic change, and the need for more inclusive growth. In many countries around the world with investment banks, they benefit from the provision of patient strategic investments that focus on the major economic challenges. National promotional banks play an important role in actively creating and shaping new markets, helping countries rebalance their economies, improve productivity, and tackle big societal challenges. Countries like China, Germany and other European nations are proactively confronting key social and environmental challenges in this way. For example, the German KFW supports SMEs, export promotion, environmental protection, innovation and international development. This has been championed by Mariana Mazzacuto uh, through her membership of our Council of Economic Advisers and I would wish to thank her for her work on this. This bank's role in financing and directing investment by leveraging public and private capital into a significant source of strategic and long-term finance, this can be channeled into key areas and can be transformative for our economy. I will do, yes. Marto Fraser. I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way at, at this point. We already have a Scottish Investment Bank, we have the SME Holding Fund and we have Scottish Enterprise, all supporting business. Can the Cabinet Secretary illustrate how the new bank will provide functions not provided by these current institutions. Keith Brown. Yes, I think, the, um, first of all, it's worth saying that we'll come on to this later on uh, in my speech, that the two of the three mentioned by, three instruments, if you like, mentioned by Murdo Fraser, should be working within the bank in due course. So that should help in terms of uh, any clutter. But I think both in terms of the scale uh, of the monies available to the investment bank and also the activities, the idea of shaping new markets, I think, are two uh, of a number of ways in which it will be different from that which has gone before. And that seems to have been accepted by the stakeholders and many commentators in terms of the case for the bank. Uh, the Scottish Government, as I say, has accepted the plan's recommendation on capitalisation and it's committed to investing £2 billion over 10 years. 
That scale is deemed to be both ambitious and achievable, making a material difference to the supply of capital to the Scottish economy. It requires an average of £200 million per year of capital from the Scottish Government over a decade. £2 billion as an initial target is consistent with other national investment banks. International comparators indicate the level of public capitalisation typically ranges between 0.5 and 1.5% of GDP. In a Scottish context, £2 billion broadly equates to 1.3% of GDP. And we've already taken the first steps. The 2018-19 draft budget included £150 million over three years for a new Building Scotland fund. That fund and its investments should in due course come under the bank's remit. A further £340 million is to be made available between 2019 and 2021, subject to future budgets. And that means that almost half a billion pounds has already been identified as the initial down payment on the £2 billion figure I've mentioned. And this is only the start of building up a significant asset base. A key objective of the bank will be bringing in additional capital from private sector investors and to increase the number of active private investors in the Scottish marketplace. For example, co-investment with the business angel community is an established successful model already used by Scottish Enterprise, and that's helped to increase the number of investment deals taking place in the early stage risk capital investment market and growing the number of private sector players. The institution will operate on a commercial basis. It will offer debt and equity, which should be repaid over 10 to 15 years. It will be independent from ministers with the board deciding where to invest and on what terms. This is essential in order for it to be flexible and responsive. The priorities for the bank, though, will be set by ministers. The types of investment, though, will be determined by the board, and it should include strategic and patient capital over all stages of firms and businesses' investment life cycle so that they are able to accelerate innovation and make a stronger contribution to the Scottish economy. Substantial financing for major projects which support regeneration and communities and investment in new ideas to help us to meet the key economic, environmental and social challenges. We want Scotland to be a leader of technological change and the bank is essential to place Scotland at the forefront of economic change and innovation. Initial capitalisation is from financial transactions, so the bank will offer finance to private sector entities. However, dependent upon future capitalisation plans, the bank should be well placed to expand lending opportunities in the future. A unique feature of the bank is its mission-based approach to investment, and that means that Scottish ministers will identify a set of medium-term outcomes and a focus for the bank's investment. The bank, though, will decide how it responds to these missions and will report its progress against those missions to ministers. Core to this will be the alignment of the bank with the wider economic strategy and the priorities which have been identified and set by the Scottish Government. And this approach gives Scotland the potential to demonstrate global leadership on common challenges, including transitioning to a low-carbon economy, responding to an ageing population and wider population health, promoting inclusive growth through placemaking and regeneration. And that's why Cabinet has endorsed those areas as the types of missions we expect the bank to undertake. The Scottish Government will refine its expectations further and the missions set for the bank through consultation with stakeholders. Now, initial contact was made with Her Majesty's Treasury officials about the bank and the additional year-end budget flexibility that will be required for it prior to publication of the implementation plan. And the bank will need this flexibility in order to have the desired impact on the Scottish economy and the ability to effectively manage a pipeline of investments. There is precedent for this with the British Business Bank and, of course, the Green Investment Bank, which the Scottish Government proposed is, proposed is used to inform the arrangements. And engagement with Treasury about this flexibility continues. The Scottish Government agrees that the bank should be a public body classified in order to ensure direct alignment between the activities of the bank, the broader economic policy and the Scottish Government's enterprise and skills agencies. The implementation plan recommended that all financing activities should come under the bank's remit, and this includes the Scottish Investment Bank, as mentioned previously by Murdo Fraser. And thinking on how the bank will relate to existing bodies, initiatives and financing activities has begun. Where appropriate, we believe these should be consolidated within the bank. Existing business advice and support provided by the enterprise agencies and infrastructure advice via Scottish Futures Trust should also be aligned with the bank's activity. 
There is an opportunity to enhance the work that we currently do to stimulate demand for finance in the Scottish economy and to enhance the financial readiness of firms. There is also an opportunity to streamline the provision of and access to finance for businesses. The Bank will have a board with the Chair of the Bank and the non-executive board members appointed by Scottish Ministers. It is envisaged that the executive management team appointments will be made by the board and work to establish the most effective operating model for the Bank will be agreed during 2018. It is essential the Bank secures the right people. Despite its intended status as a public body, terms and conditions of employment must reflect its place in the finance sector. And I'm clear this does not mean bankers' salaries with all the negative connotations with which everyone is familiar. But it does mean a market-based approach which reflects this institution's requirements and characteristics. Further work will be undertaken to establish options for pay and salaries and overall conditions of employment related to the bank. I'll give way to Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. Just in terms of the uh, recruitment of the necessary people to, to run the bank, uh, the estimate is that annual running costs of the banks will be around £30 million. Do you have any concerns about the duplication of co costs involved in setting up and running this new bank, as well as the various other enterprise agencies? Can I remind members to speak through the chair, please? Keith Brown. I can say that uh, I first of all mentioned the um, considerations that are being given to decluttering of the landscape, which could in turn uh, realise some savings in relation to that. But we don't envisage that the bank will be supplanting the activities and functions of the enterprise or other agencies beyond those which I've mentioned already. So I don't have a concern about that. I think there is, to be fair though, more work to be done on the costs that are involved in this. But the uh, Governance arrangements, things like pay and the costs, will be subject to proper review and assessment, uh, ensuring value for money and the control of costs through full and thorough scrutiny of plans for the bank's operation. Also, early establishment of a stakeholder group with, will guide further development of the operational detail, governance and accountability arrangements for the bank. And wider society interests will have a role in informing and shaping the bank balanced against the board's independence and accountability. And I'm keen to explore ways in which this can be delivered. A bill will be brought forward in 2019 to establish and capitalise the bank. And we aim to have the bank operating in shadow form in 2019, pending the passage of this legislation. Presiding officer, I believe that a publicly owned investment bank will become a cornerstone of the economy we want to create in Scotland. And it also has the potential to be truly transformative, operating under a core set of principles and missions supporting sustainable growth and bringing benefits to individuals and communities across the country, making Scotland in the process a fairer and more prosperous country. And I therefore invite the Chamber to support the motion in my name. I call Dean Lockhart to speak to and move Amendment 12076.1 for up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy. Presiding officer, uh, this debate on the proposed National Investment Bank is important because Scotland's economy continues to face a number of challenges. These challenges were highlighted in evidence given by Nora Senior to the Economy Committee, which identified a number of economic targets that have been missed in the areas of productivity, innovation, internationalisation, business, investment and in economic growth, where Scotland has trailed behind the UK in every year since 2009. Failure to reach these and other economic targets has cost the Scottish economy more than £80 billion. So we agree it is time for a step change in policy and to address some of these challenges, the Scottish Government has proposed the establishment of the bank, which would, as the Cabinet Secretary said, provide greater levels of patient long-term capital, increase support for exporting companies and help SMEs to scale up. The implementation plan for the bank points to examples in other countries where national investment banks have improved economic performance. And I have worked with national investment banks in China, Singapore, India and Japan, and I agree that they can improve economic performance. However, they can only do this if it's part of a coherent economic policy framework where there is clarity of focus and delivery, alignment across government, enterprise agencies and business, and a supportive environment for the establishment and growth of business in the first place. Our concern is that this clarity, alignment and support for business has been absent from SNP economic policy for a number of years. As the Fraser Vander has commented, the SNP has lost clarity of focus and delivery with a myriad of different strategies, advisory groups, and I, I will in a second, and bodies now cluttering the landscape. Fraser Vander goes on to say, this is holding back growth, leading to confusion and a lack of alignment, duplication 
and weakened accountability. I'll give way. Derek Mackay. Can I thank uh, Dean Lockhart for taking the intervention? Uh, can the member identify just a few strategies that uh, the Conservatives think the Scottish Government should do without? Dean Lockhart. Well, uh, actually, the Economy Committee has been looking at the performance of Scotland's economy. And let me answer the question. The concept of inclusive growth, which is your government's, sorry, the government's overarching strategy, has no economic meaning. Nora Senior says it, it, it means different things to different people. How can agencies align around uh, uh, an economic policy that has no economic meaning? That's one big area, I would say to Derek Mackay, that we would fix. Uh, I, I need to make some progress. Presiding officer, we support many of the objectives behind these proposals, but the bank is being introduced into an enterprise landscape that is already cluttered and confused and is being introduced through an economic policy framework which lacks strategic direction. Stakeholders and business organisations have raised a number of these concerns in the consultation process and if the Scottish Government wants our support for the bank proposals, it will have to address a number of these concerns. First, the, proposals need to, the, the bank proposals need to avoid duplication of costs and activities and deliver greater value for money for Scottish taxpayers. Scottish taxpayers already pay over £100 per head more than the rest of the UK on enterprise development, but with poorer outcomes. And the cost to the Scottish taxpayer is set to increase. The estimated cost of running the new bank, as I mentioned to the Cabinet Secretary, is £30 million a year. That's in addition to the £120 million spent on the other uh, enterprise agencies on their operational costs. In other words, Scottish taxpayer will be forking out £150 million a year in running costs for these agencies. And that's before a single penny is given to help business. So the Cabinet Secretary has to explain how he will cut out this duplication of running costs and achieve much greater value for Scottish taxpayers. Uh, the second point we want the government to address is greater, greater clarity on how the bank will interact with the various other existing enterprise agencies, something that has been touched upon. Jim McCall, in talking, uh, giving evidence to the Economy Committee, said the landscape is too cluttered. The support needs to be more focused. We agree with this. So if the bank, I, I, I will in a bit, if the bank is to have any positive impact on Scotland's economy, the Scottish Government will need to take steps to streamline the cluttered landscape. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary wants to tell us how he's going to do that. Keith Brown. Can I thank Dean Locker for taking intervention and say that I've already mentioned a couple of examples in terms of the Scottish Investment Bank um, where that can happen. But the cluttering of the landscape has been referred to by a number of commentators and individuals, and it refers to the activities of both the governments involved in the Scottish economy. Does he think there's any scope for decluttering on the part of the UK government? <laughs> Dean Lockhart. Well, we've spoken about this before, but I, I think this is a plan that the Scottish Government is putting together to address. So presumably you think you have control over some of or most of these areas if you're putting a long term plan together on this area. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the bank has to gain credibility in the marketplace and be run independently of ministerial um, uh, interference. We cannot have another repeat of the shambles we saw last year with the Scottish Growth Scheme, where it was announced by the First Minister as a half billion pounds vote of confidence in the Scottish economy, only for less than 5% of this amount to be made available to business. Uh, the Scottish Government's uh, motion today talks about the bank helping to uh, uh, helping Scotland to achieve its full economic potential. For Scotland to achieve its full economic potential, it's not enough just to make available additional finance. There has to be an environment that is conducive for business, for small business to grow, export and scale up in Scotland. And the SP policies over the last decade have not helped this environment. The large business supplement punishes business for expanding. Increasing business rates are forcing businesses to close and making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK is making, I need to conclude, making Scotland Members the highest tax part minute. of the UK is making it difficult for innovative companies to expand. Presiding officer, let me conclude. The most important challenge the Scottish economy faces today is the SNP itself. Failure by the SNP to reach its own economic targets has cost the Scottish economy more than £80 billion. Pounds. Our, amendment today, Members just closing. our amendment today reflects concerns raised by leading organisations across Scotland that the enterprise landscape is too cluttered and is leading to confusion, a lack of alignment, duplication and weakened accountability. We support many of the objectives behind the bank, 
but the Scottish Government must address the issues we have raised today if it expects our support for these proposals in the future. I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move amendment 12076.2 up to six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. They do say that good things come to those who wait. Well, we have been extraordinarily patient because it's fair to say that it's been years since the Scottish National Investment Bank was first announced, then re-announced and re-announced again. In fact, I think I counted nine separate announcements spanning a number of years and cabinet secretaries. So let me truly welcome the imminent creation of the Scottish National Investment Bank and welcome to the acceptance of all the recommendations in the implementation plan. But you know, having waited this long, I would at least have expected the plans to be slightly bolder and more ambitious. I welcome the implementation plan put forward by Benny Higgins, but do consider the amount of funding announced so far to be quite timid. Now is the time, surely, for radical, decisive action. Our economy is stagnating. The truth is, we are flirting with recession. GDP for the last quarter showed growth of a mere 0.3%. The Scottish Fiscal Commission are forecasting growth of less than 1% up to 2020. And over the past few years, our growth has trailed behind growth for the rest of the UK as a whole. So that context makes stimulating economic growth an absolutely urgent priority. The problem for the Scottish Government in the past was it had no means to capitalise the bank and so it never really truly got off the ground. Now, they have financial transaction money from the UK Government, described, I think, by the Finance Secretary Derek Mackay as funny money when first announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and now welcomed with open arms as a key part of the Government's budget. There's nothing quite like a convert, presiding officer. But you know, no, but whatever your view, whatever your view, this provides some of the capital required to fund the bank, albeit that it is loan funding. It is the scale that is the issue. 340 million announced so far, up to 2 billion in the next 10 years, it's a start. But I don't believe that this will create the kind of transformational change we all want to see in the Scottish economy. In contrast, Scottish Labour would invest 20 billion over the same period in the Scottish Investment Bank, 10 times the amount proposed by the Scottish Government. We want to see the money invested in SMEs because they make up the overwhelming majority of our economy. We want to see the money invested in environmentally transformative projects and renewables, and of course, in innovation. There is much with which we agree with the Cabinet Secretary, and I'll give way. Keith can Brown. I, can I thank Jackie Bailey for uh, giving way and just ask her on the 20 billion if she could maybe just itemise how much was allocated in Labour's draft budget for the Scottish National Investment Bank this year and how much you'd intend to allocate from future budgets. Um, Jackie I, Bailey. I, I, I only have up to six minutes but let me say not only would we match your plans that are currently in place we would attempt to exceed them and I've described to you that Labour across the UK would put in place a £200 billion national investment bank, of which Scotland's share would be £20 billion. I think that's ambitious. But the bank, the difference is the bank would sit within a coherent industrial strategy that would both grow our economy and create jobs. But that's not all, because the Scottish Government has access to capital borrowing of up to £450 million every year, some of which could also be used. But Scottish Labour would go further. We would invest another 20 billion over 10 years as part of Labour's National Transformation Fund. That's serious money for key infrastructure investment and boosting research and development. Something, again, I think we should all welcome. So that's 40 billion pounds of investment in infrastructure, housing, businesses, jobs, growing the economy. That's the kind of investment that will be transformative, that's bold, ambitious, and not simply tinkering about the edges. And aside from the, no, I've already taken one. Aside from the difference in scale, there is the expectation of delivery. The SNP is very good. In fact, I would go so far as to say excellent at making grand announcements, but they're not so good at actually delivering against them. So we have the Scottish Growth Scheme, the centerpiece of the programme for government in 2016. 
This was to be a £500 million scheme that would help to transform the economy. Yet since then, only 31 businesses have received investment. Just 6% of the money available has been allocated. That, presiding officer, is woeful. And I'm not sure whether the criteria are too onerous or it's a bureaucratic nightmare, but whatever the reason, we need to do much better. We need access to the Scottish Investment Bank to be easy and simple so that barriers are not created that put businesses off from applying. It's one thing to announce money and another entirely to ensure that it is delivered to the businesses that need it. It's also important that the Scottish Investment Bank complements overall policy. But the SNP government lacks an up-to-date economic strategy. There's no industrial strategy. You don't even align yourself with sections of the UK industrial strategy as they affect Scotland. And commentators have observed there is little policy alignment or coherence. The landscape is cluttered with various initiatives, but they don't add up to a policy whole. And that is a pretty damning verdict. What this needs is ambition, a vision, a plan, and then it's all about delivery. The Scottish Government should learn from the mistakes it has made before and ensure that the Scottish Investment Bank has sufficient capital and is easy to access. In closing, presiding officer, our economy is not in a good place. A Scottish Investment Bank could make a difference, but the Cabinet Secretary and the Government need to be focused on making sure that it actually really delivers. I move the amendment in my name. Uh, before I invite Mr Reitman to, to speak, can I remind members that whether it's as part of a speech or whether it's during interventions, it's not private conversations that are going on and everything should be directed through the chair. And I call Mr Reitman. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> presiding officer. Uh, Greens welcome uh, this debate on the Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, a wide range of thinkers over the years have advocated the creation of such a bank, most recently the New Economics Foundation, Friends of the Earth Scotland, Commonweal and Move Your Money, whose 2016 report, Banking for the Common Good, outlined a vision of such a state investment institution and the role it could play uh, in Scotland. I think it's particularly important given that the UK has got a very distorted banking and financial services environment with privately owned global institutions, a recent history of speculation and wealth transfers in property markets and the development of exotic derivative financial instruments rather than a practice of investment in the real uh, economy. And in Scotland too, we have a history and a habit of fetishizing the financial services industry when in reality, parts of it, such as Royal Bank of Scotland, were historically destroying the economy rather than supporting it. And other countries in this context do provide examples of more sustainable models of banking, such as the German Sparkas and 431 locally owned public savings banks who own the eight lands bank and, and working with the German state investment bank, KFW, that the cabinet secretary referred to, uh, making uh, loans. Indeed, the Spark has and made 45% of all long-term business lending uh, in 2012, more than double what was made by German commercial banks. And there's a lesson there, and I think one we need to learn from as a matter of urgency. Now, I note the, the government's intention that the bank uh, be bold and ambitious, and we share that vision. Uh, but, I think as the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged in his opening remarks, there is much work ahead to make that a reality. And my amendment lays out a number of the issues that we consider need to be addressed. In particular, although the implementation plan dismisses the argument for a banking licence, we invite the government to consider whether indeed a licence could offer greater flexibility in providing for the power to take deposits and create electronic money. And in our amendment, we, too, we also focus on the need for a strategic focus on the future of the Scottish economy by investing in low-carbon technologies to build energy resilience. And we highlight, too, the question of, of housing. Uh, no economy can be sustainable when growing numbers of its young people cannot afford basic, affordable and warm homes. With social renting off-limits to all but the most financially challenged and affording, affordable housing not worthy of that descriptor, an investment bank has a key role to play in providing the kind of strategic housing investment that's desperately needed. I question the focus in the implementation plan on, I quote, catalyzing private investment to achieve a step change in growth for the Scottish economy. Growth, even inclusive growth, is a questionable goal 
when some of the key investments we need in energy efficiency, for example, will in the long term reduce conventional metrics such as GDP, as indeed will investment in sustainable transport. And that's where, why we're not inclined to support the Labour amendment with its uncritical arguments for growth. Indeed, in the, in the, uh, as Mariana Matsukuta herself said uh, in The Spectator this week, many businesses we are told are value creators are actually value extractors. Uh, and in an interview in the New Statesman this week as well, um, she points out that, in fact, the financial services industry was never included in GDP until the early 1970s because many such services are no more than transactions and add nothing to economic activity. So, a public investment bank does not exist to plug gaps in conventional commercial lending. I think we're all agreed on that. It should have a role in the prudent provision of patient capital, but its role should be strategic, focused and long term. Our amendment calls for Parliament to have a key role in establishing the bank's ethical investment code, something that the implementation plan refers to merely as a backstop, but which in our view should be enshrined in the primary legislation establishing the bank. This legislation should also set down the mission, the governance and the accountability mechanisms. We also float the idea that the bank could provide a Scottish payments company to reduce the cost to small businesses of processing payments. Again, this cost uh, uh, reduction will lower GDP, but increase productivity. Currently, around 2% of the value of payments is lost to the Scottish economy, about a billion pounds a year at a rough estimate. My amendment also calls for a diverse board, a key piece of the governance framework and a matter in which I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's early confirmation. In the implementation plan, the scoping statement of the bank states that it should, I quote, should be set up to be an enduring institution that provides a strategic step change in Scotland's economic architecture. We agree, uh, and for a start, that means focusing on delivering an institution that thinks and does things very differently, and that also brings the clarity and focus in the cluttered policy landscape identified in Dean Lockhart's amendment, for which I have some uh, sympathy. There are plenty of good examples of how to create effective public investment banks. And we would like to acknowledge the work of Professor Mariana Matsukato and Laurie McFarlane in drawing attention to institutional international examples of best practice. And as a national in financial institution, we all have vested collective interest to make sure this bank will invest in projects and programmes that deliver a sustainable uh, future. So in conclusion, presiding officer, it would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could tell Parliament what discussions are underway with the Treasury, with the Bank of England, the Financial Conduct Authority, and indeed with the EU, to pave the way for a bank that's able to raise its own finance and leverage its balance sheet. And it would be useful also if you could be clear on how the bank's mission will be set and confirm that this will be a role for Parliament. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. By my omission uh, and for the official report, I should have said Amendment 12076.3. Thank you. And I call Willie Rennie. Um, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, Scotland's growth is stagnant. A brush with recession this time last year has been replaced by marginal growth. Annual growth of 0.8% in Scotland in 2017 compared with 1.8% in the UK is pretty pathetic. When it comes to jobs, Scotland now trails the UK as well. The boasts of ministers have come undone. So the question is how we can kickstart the economy. My party has called for a transformational investment in education and mental health. Investing in people is the best way to enable everyone to achieve their potential, boost productivity and establish a high wage, high scale economy for the long term. But creating new and additional business lending can be part of the solution too. Vince Cable, as the business secretary, reached the same conclusion way back in 2012 and created the British Business Bank. The Benny, Benny Higgins has fleshed out the, the detail and the principles with his implementation plan that he's published quite recently. It identifies the opportunities that come with having a different risk appetite and strategic focus. And it suggests what the initial product range could be. Uh, I would like to briefly pick up on a few of the recommendations. Alongside making a return, the bank is set to be closely aligned to the government economic and social policy. So what will its policy be on assisting companies that don't pay the living wage? 
We know healthy employment practices contribute to a healthier economy, and I don't want to see a repeat of the Scottish Enterprise giving Amazon millions of pounds and turning a blind eye to the needs of its workers. And will recommendation seven, calling for a report on the bank's social, environmental and ethical returns, be taken forward? Um, there is also the small matter of how much capital and leverage the bank will attract. It needs to pack a punch and deliver serious investment for the Scottish economy, but within a framework that takes a broader view of what constitutes a worthwhile return. Any bank in possession of millions, of hundreds of millions of pounds, whether retail or investment, needs experienced people with sound judgment. Recommendation 20 says the bank will need staff with the right mix of skills and experience. And the government should, in the quotes, should ensure that the bank can offer employment and remuneration terms which are sufficiently competitive to attract suitably skilled and experienced people. We know that those at the top of the financial sector are accustomed to salaries and bonuses that far exceed the average. But this isn't something that people would expect to be replicated in this public sector institution. Lavish salaries aren't an option. It would be the responsibility of ministers to strike that balance. I'm sure Parliament would welcome an early indication of how they will get the right people with the banking and investment backgrounds at each level of the organisation and at a cost that the public sector would consider reasonable. I was pleased to see that the expectation that the bank's board and executive management team are gender balanced. I trust this will be matched by a gender pay gap of zero. Thanks to the transparency measures introduced by my colleague Joe Swinson, we now know that financial services have some of the biggest differences between the average hourly earnings of women and men. It is as high as 59% at HSBC. There is an opportunity for the Scottish National Investment Bank to demonstrate leadership on this, and I would like to hear from the Minister when he sums up on that matter. Of course, there is a precedent for creating a bank such as this. Benny Higgins counted 90 such institutions around the world. The British Business Bank has been up and running since November 2014, four years ago. That 5,382 SMEs in Scotland have received funding via its programmes. 3,063 startups have benefited too. In this implementation plan, Benny Higgins recommends that the bank's activities should be aligned with the activities of the British Business Bank in Scotland, which may require establishing a strategy and alignment between both institutions. The two institutions should be complementary, ensuring that the right mix of support is available. It should also be made clear to businesses north of the border that the existence of a Scottish equivalent will not preclude their accessing finance through the British Business Bank. As Dean Lockhart's amendment notes, the Fraser of Allender Institute has warned that a cluttered policy landscape risks diluting the Scottish Government's economy strategy. It has launched so many programmes and strategies that ministers can't see the wood for the trees. We can't afford for time and resources to be expended on creating this bank, only for it to be added to the list of initiatives that have failed to have some kind of impact. At the top of that list is arguably the £500 million growth scheme, the big idea for 2016, the year before the bank was given the same billing. The growth scheme is still to pay out a single penny in loans and guarantees. Equity funding isn't new. Why should businesses have any confidence if 20 months later that scheme still isn't doing what was said on the tin? Benny Higgins has written the side of the tin for this bank. He has set out the purpose and essential ingredients. Now it is up to ministers to ensure it provides much needed stimulus for the Scottish economy. Thank you. We now move to, to the open debate. And we are a bit pushed for time, so speeches of no more than six minutes, please. I call Ivan McKay to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to remind the Chamber of my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer. 
to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy and also draw members' attention to my register of interest as a director of the Commonweal, an organisation that's done significant work placing the concept of the Scottish National Investment Bank at the centre of the Scottish economic policy debate. Presiding officer, national investment banks are an increasingly common phenomenon across the industrial development landscape of many countries, from Germany to our Nordic neighbours and globally, including countries in Asia and Latin America. The traditional role of national investment banks has been to support infrastructure spend and to provide countercyclical lending as part of a Keynesian interventionist measures. In many countries, however, the role of national investment banks is now wider and focused on the delivery of strategic missions be those the development of specific sectors and industries of national importance, fulfilling cross-sectoral objectives such as supporting new technology rollout or supporting national economic objectives such as driving e inclusive growth, supporting internationalisation or improving levels of innovation and competitiveness. These objectives are embodied in the mission statements of national investment banks and it is this area I intend to focus my remarks in the limited time I have available today considering some potential sector and technology specific areas of focus for the SNIB. The National Investment Bank model separates the execution and implementation functions from the mission setting or strategic direction process. The former is run to the high standards of professionalism to ensure funds invested are managed to ensure rigorous and full risk reward criteria are followed, protecting the significant public investment involved. The mission setting process, however, is where the direction is set for the bank, and this is where the value is added to the process in terms of how it benefits the national economy. The Scottish National Investment Bank implementation plan identifies three broad categories for the focus of the bank, including support for early stage SME investment, scaling up of SME investment, and mission-led patient long-term investment. It also identifies the need to address market failure where current private sector investment is absence, absent, often as a consequence of differing risk appetite profiles. It is into this area where the need for patient capital intersects with the national strategic economic objectives and direction that the bank can contribute greatly and can deliver its twin objectives of making a return in excess of the cost of capital at portfolio level and achieving inclusive and social economic benefits. The implementation plan also recognises the need to ensure investments made by the bank act as a catalyst for additional private sector investment and do not act to crowd out private investors. Mission setting, as I've said, is key to the long-term success of the SNIB and of how much it can contribute to Scotland's economic growth. It gives us the ability to focus on building specific sectors tailored to our economy's strengths and opportunities. This includes not only the need to support the creation of new sectors and technologies, but also the creation and shaping of markets for the products and sectors uh, services generated by those new industries. Scotland has no shortage of sectors where we can leverage strengths, combining industrial capability, brand recognition and academic excellence. These include life sciences, food and drink, tourism, renewable energy and creative industries, to name but a few. Housing and energy are also areas for investment would result in significant benefits in terms of job creation, social benefits and environmental impacts. I would however like to focus briefly on a sector where I think the Scottish National Investment Bank do, would do well to consider including in its scope. That is automation, in particular autonomous vehicles. This is, I suggest, an ideal candidate to be one of the technologies included in the bank's mission statement. Members will be aware of my interest in this area, having brought self-drive vehicles on several occasions into this chamber not literally, and it's an area where the opportunity to shape both markets and industries exists. And the timing is right, with the ramp up in self-drive adoption expected to be significant in the next five to 10 years. Investment in an industrial hub to support autonomous vehicle technologies, of which there are several companies already involved in in Scotland, alongside the rollout of the technology in specific urban and rural settings, would act to generate global interest and act as a magnet for additional private sector investment one of the key objectives of the Scottish National Investment Bank. The SNIB gives us the opportunity to leap forward, forward in the technology game, and it should be seen as an opportunity to do so, not just to prop up sectors where managed decline is required. The mission statement for a national investment bank is key to success, and it, effectively, and it is effectively the embodiment of an industrial strategy. Indeed, it goes further in industrial strategy as it provides not only the intent, but also the mechanism for delivery of the elements of an industrial strategy. 
Some comments have also been made previously on the cluttered landscape of investment support, notwithstanding the fact that different challenges require different tailored investment solutions at different times, and having different investment support opportunities available to business can be of benefit to those business. The implementation of the Scottish National Investment Bank will actually serve to simplify the current landscape. It will, as implementation plan makes clear, consolidate several existing investment provisions under one roof. In conclusion, presiding officer, in an environment where many significant levers of economic control, including those impacting macroeconomic policy, are not on the, under the control of our national parliament, it is essential that we take every opportunity to drive inclusive growth in Scotland. The Scottish National Investment Bank is one such significant step in that direction, building up the Scottish economy, following a model that is well tried and tested internationally. And I look forward to the rollout of the bank and the benefits it will bring. Alexander Burnett, followed by Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to take part in today's debate on the Scottish National Investment Bank Implementation Plan. And as my colleagues have already touched upon, the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of policies and proposals that seek to boost Scotland's small businesses, high streets and our wider economy. And coming from a business background, I know all too well how helpful or not governments can be in assisting businesses to reach their potential. And I'm wary of the proposals set out by the SNP, but I'm keen to ensure that we work together to ensure that our overall goal to help businesses remain the focus of this conversation. And before I continue, I'd like to note members to my register of interest, particularly in relation to businesses I own and have shares in. Now, upon first view of the plans for the Scottish National Investment Bank, you can't help but get a sense of deja vu for it appears that this is a simple rehash and shift of the SNP's other investment agencies to under one roof. The Scottish Investment Bank, the SME Holding Fund, the Scottish Growth Scheme, the Building Scotland Fund, and further Scottish Investment Bank funds. So is this simply a collaboration of the SNP's numerous other investment products? And it appears so. So when we are at a time when we find ourselves falling behind in productivity, we must ensure we are not duplicating efforts. And that is why today, my colleagues and I are asking for some clarity on how this investment bank will operate and how it will fit within an enterprise landscape which is already overcrowded. So perhaps the SNP will admit themselves that the Scottish National Investment Bank is a duplication, for they mention it in their own implementation plan, but it remains an option to simply increase funding of the Scottish Investment Bank. So for a more specific example, Scottish National Investment Bank proposals seek to fill the gap in the market for financing SMEs of up to 10 million. But the Scottish Investment Bank already does that, and this is stated in the implementation plan. So we need to focus on matching the UK's growth rates. And instead of looking for the next press headline, we must start focusing on the long-term policies that can really benefit our businesses. Because the SNP's lack of focus is having an impact. And today's papers show that the SNP have missed plans to match the UK GDP. They've missed plans to match even small EU countries' GDP. They fail to increase productivity. They fail to increase exports. And they fail to increase research and development. Uh, in total, this has cost Scotland more than £80 billion during their time in charge. So. Keith Brown. Can I thank the member for taking intervention? Maybe just uh, would he recognise that the last figures for GDP for Scotland are, as Jackie Bailey said, 0.3%. The last figures for the UK government is 0.1%. And does he acknowledge, as his front bench won't, the UK government is an active player in the Scottish economy? Alexander Burnett. I think if you ask any business in Scotland who's been in charge and who's been affecting their business most over the last 10 years, I think you'll find they'll talk about the SNP and the Scottish government. Yeah. So, as my colleagues have also mentioned, the Fraser of Allender Institute have also criticised the SNP's cluttered landscape and said they have lost clarity of focus, which is hurting economic growth. And they've cluttered the landscape so much that Nicola Sturgeon's own staff had to ask which investment bank a freedom of information request was referring to when asked. So if the SNP don't have clarity over what is happening, how can it expect businesses to? And I do worry that with this comes a failure to deliver. For this is not the first time that the SNP government have announced a promise to invest in our business community with no follow through. 
The Scottish growth scheme has failed to deliver a single penny of loans and guarantees after 18 months into a three-year scheme, despite being the original reason for it being established. And this is no surprise when only 25 million has been allocated, even though it was supposed to be a 500 million pound three-year plan. And this is only one example of the many broken promises by the SNP. But I want to reiterate that the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of measures that begin to, begin to fix our poor economic record. And coming from a business background, I've seen the benefit the governments are able to bring to the business world through policy. So Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives want to see businesses thrive, as we know this benefits workers, which in turn benefits our communities. And we fully support the intent behind the Scottish National Investment Bank, knowing that this will help address challenges and boost the Scottish economy. So today, I ask what difference does the SNP envisage this making to the development of businesses in the North East? And I join my colleagues in their call for further clarity on the details of their proposal to ensure that we do not face a simple rehash of other organisations. Thank you. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I should also note that I am the PLO for the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Um, having had, not had as long to wait as Jackie Bailey has for this uh, National Investment Bank, I think it's a great idea, and I get the impression that most people across this uh, chamber agree with uh, me as well. We often have this sense that uh, when it comes to innovation, it's best left in the hands of uh, private investors and that politicians should keep to the day job of, of policy and that if we really want to see long-term innovation, it will be driven by the, the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Steve Jobs of this world. And yet, if we look back over the last century in particular, we see that some of the biggest breakthroughs in technology and in innovation has been pioneered by the state. And that's usually because whether innovation will be a success or not is usually very uncertain and takes longer than the, the traditional banks or the venture capitalists are willing to wait. And in countries that are, are very small, whether it's uh, Singapore or countries that are very big, like the USA and China, it's often been the, been the state that's provided the kind of patient and long-term finance that new technologies need to get off the ground. And that has obviously often been driven by um, big missions, which is a word that comes up quite a lot in the implementation plan big missions of solving climate change or putting a human being on the moon. And it's not just required funding basic research, but it's also um, been a case of applying that research. And again, we see it with something like Apple, where uh, in the early stages, obviously, government um, provided the necessary cash support in order to, to grow business. And now every time we use an iPhone, we can thank um, a state that once invested in technology like that. And I would suggest, too, that examples on a much smaller scale are found within our own country, again, on a totally different scale and with far more of a social and economic purpose. We see the way that Highlands and Islands Enterprise has been able to target investment and funding and achieve its uh, social and economic aims of uh, turning around depopulation and building up the economy. And we all seem to be looking for, for quick fixes to economic growth. The Tories are, are largely concerned with the blame game at the moment as to whose fault these figures are. One, some might argue cynically that that's to divert attention, but I won't go down that route. Yes, oh, two at the same time, ladies first. Gillian Martin. I'm, ve I'm very grateful to, to Kate Forbes for uh, taking my intervention. Would she agree that when it comes to the Highlands and Islands, the loss of European structural funds is making that even ever more pressing, that there's another avenue to get funds into... Uh, Ms Martin, could you speak into your microphone so that we can hear you, please? Yep. Would you repeat we'll that? say it again. Um, would Kate Forbes agree with me that given that the European structural funds are about to be removed as a result of Brexit, this is ever more pressing? 
Kate Forbes. I agreed with her the first time and I agreed even more the second time. Um, it's true, and again, that, that's an example. And to the point that's been made about the cluttered landscape, I mean, I think it's a genuine question because with the creation of any new body, any new public body, there has got to be a streamlined strategy with every public body knowing what its primary purpose is and ensuring that there is no duplication. And I think that it will be deeply unfortunate when European structural funds are removed. Um, and and talk, talking about economic growth in particular, I mean, I look at it through the lens of, of population productivity and participation. And if we look at the potential for an uh, investment bank on all three fronts with population. We really want entrepreneurs to move to Scotland. We want them to bring their ideas here, to choose to, to set up business here, and then to expand their ideas and employ a workforce which will directly go to uh, attracting more people to move to Scotland. We then want to improve our productivity, and that can be done fairly straightforwardly using technology and innovation. And again, if the investment bank is targeted at innovation and uh, high tech um, startups or uh, expansion, then it will go towards improving our productivity. And then lastly, participation. We talk a lot about inclusivity inclusivity so that nobody is left behind, so that our employment rates are as high as they can be. And also regional inclusivity as well. When I look again at the, the th say, three growth sectors in Scotland, take food and drink, the renewables industry and tourism, none of them would be doing as well as they are doing without my own constituency and own region of the Highlands. Because as much as people want to come and see uh, Glasgow, I would argue that they're largely on their way to the Highlands. And um, when it comes to food and drink, you see so many small businesses, small SMEs in places like the Highlands and Islands who don't have access to the funds to ensure them, enable them to grow because commercial lending has not uh, been accessible to them. And whilst, yes, there is a place for um, advice and expertise and support, at the end of the day, in order to grow, they need access to finance. And it's not just finance to do them for the next uh, year or three years, which is largely what commercial lending will provide. It's actually the, the finance that will take a risk on them and support them for the next 15 years. Claudia Beamish, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to take the short time I have to explore the important development of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Put forward some of the criteria, I think, and others think are important for consideration and highlight some of the range of businesses, organisations and public bodies which I believe should be considered for inclusion in those who can apply for funds. We must ask ourselves what sort of an economy, society and environment we want to support. The recommendation of the, of the, of the report for a balanced scorecard approach uh, being required that reports on the financial performance as well as on the economic impact over time, including social, environmental and ethical returns, is indeed welcome. And uh, the Environment Link uh, submission stresses the necessity of taking into account the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well. Clear eligibility criteria for the SNIB will be essential, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcements today. I suggest that one of the eligibility criteria could be that whoever applies must be a living wage employer. For example, uh, uh, one example of such a company is in my region, Tempris Brewery, which is small, thriving and growing. The tired old argument that a firm is too small is not acceptable. As we shift to the low carbon co economy as well, uh, the SNIB must provide an opportunity to develop uh, the, this, in this direction. The Herald leader of the 3rd of May states, the think time or cat catapult says thousands of jobs could be created if major new projects get the go-ahead. But the benefits will not appear from nowhere. The Scottish Government has to provide a power boost of its own, investment in the business and technologies that could make that happen. So, the SNIB can make a significant contribution here, but only if robustly linked to a real industrial strategy. The STUC in its briefing pulls sharp focus on the Just Transition Partnership and states the STUC would urge the Scottish Government to incorporate Just Transition principles in the remit. 
The STUC has played an active role in the Just Transition Partnership and is keen to see the new Just Transition Commission have a powerful role remit and representation for work ensuring that the transformation to the low carbon economy is carried out fairly, supporting those communities and workers where industries and jobs must change and investing in retraining and measures to tackle disadvantage in the labour market. Regionality should also be considered as a fundamental criteria to ensure that all Scotland benefits from the new public bank, whether the Highlands, as Kate Forbes has highlighted, or in my own region of South Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway figures put the need to support smaller and local enterprises in rural Scotland into stark perspective. Here, of the 6,000 businesses registered, 90% have 10 employees or fewer. How can it be that these, those who have the potential to expand have not always been properly supported, frankly, through the business gateway? And there is now an opportunity to link the New South Scotland Enterprise Agency with the criteria and pathways to the SNIB. One such company is McCreeber, an innovative firm which is in the vanguard of the circular economy, making road surfaces out of recycled plastic. It is remote, rural and growing and needs support, like many others. Another eligibility criteria must surely be the consideration of inclusive ownership models, municipal, public, community and cooperative as well. The SNIB should, in my view, have as part of its remit supporting the expansion of cooperative, mutual and social enterprise sectors through the provision of patient capital. The role of the Cooperative Development Scotland organisation could be enhanced so that it operates as a champion of the cooperative and mutual sector and feeds into the SNIB. And there could even be an annual report of investment in the cooperative sector. Support for businesses which put money back into the local economy should be a priority. Despite the social cooperative and SME sector's crucial role in the economy, they face a number of barriers to growth through difficulty in getting investment from high street lenders and the high cost of credit. And the SNIB can and must, in my view, be a strong focus which helps those who experience these barriers. A further way that can give support, uh, and I only want to highlight this briefly, but it would certainly relieve unnecessary stress, is through support for charities who do not have significant bank reserves, such as the Lanark Development Trust, which received a grant offer from LIDA, and th this was to be paid retrospectively. So they weren't able to take the, the, the loan, except uh, because a, a local business stepped in, but this is not always the case. And the SNIB could perhaps support short-term loans at very low rates, which I'm sure would help a lot of charitable groups. For many types of the enterprises I and others have highlighted, there is, of course, the necessity of patient capital, and this is absolutely imperative. However, for it to succeed over many years, it is essential that while there will be a greater degree of risk and greater forbearance, there must also be specific criteria for recognising where loans are non-performing and a clear workout programme. A careful assessment of this will be essential so that uh, and appropriate management will prevent stagnation and enable continuing opportunity. Finally, back to the STUC submission, that the mission statement must be amended in their view to read that the, the Scottish National Investment Bank is to provide and catalyse cat catalyze investment in order cr to create opportunities for Scotland by powering innovation and accelerating the just transition transformation to a low-carbon, high-tech, connected, globally competitive and inclusive economy, which puts people and fair work at its heart. I ask the Scottish Government to carefully consider this. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be fo followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. Last year at my party's conference, the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon made the announcement that our government would create a Scottish National Investment Bank. And the announcement got a standing ovation. I was sat next to one of the ministers tasked with delivering it, if Mr. Wheelhouse remembers. And the importance of what it means to people was obvious from the response that we witnessed. A national bank supporting Scottish businesses and their economy is a real chance to do things differently. And I want to use my time today to put my views on record of the different approaches this bank could have and what I see are the opportunities to unlock latent potential and nurture new and existing business. And you'll notice I say nurture rather than just grow, and my use of language is no accident. 
As convener of the cross-party group of women in enterprise and someone who tries to represent the re many views of women-led businesses in every debate in the economy in this chamber, my taking this will come as no surprise. In the two years that I've convened the group, we have had two complete sessions on access to finance, and I don't see the topic being sidelined in our work programme anytime soon. I'm very glad to hear Willie Rennie uh, concentrate on women's issues in his speech, uh, but I note that not ha ha any of the Lib Dems have come along to the CPG, so I'd like to formally extend an invitation for someone to represent them. So I'd like to plug for the CPG there. In Scotland, women-led businesses re represent 50% of businesses receiving start-up support that are owned by women, yet only 20% of women-led businesses are making it into the growth pipeline, and only 5% of Scottish enterprise account managed businesses are run by women. And one of the, uh, the reasons for this is the finance gap. The joint submission to the consultation by Women's Enterprise Scotland in Gender Close the Gap and the Scottish Women's Budget Group has a number of key asks of the Scottish National Investment Bank, and I'd like to summarise them. They say the principle of equality and non-discrimination should be at the bank's core. Investment in infrastructure should not just be about bricks, steel and fibre optic cable. Childcare has the same Im economic impact and should be considered as infrastructure worthy of investment. The investment bank should help fund research and development that creates jobs and technologies equally targeted at both genders. Women's businesses should stop being undercapitalised and a rebalancing of finance nurturing women-led business could be an injection of over 7.6 billion into the Scottish economy. And the bank should be governed by a gender balanced, gender competent leadership team. It should gather gender disaggregated data and its client offers should be gender sensitive with all personnel involved in managing finance offers to be trained to be gender sensitive and eliminate unconscious bias out of the decision making process. And I agree with all those points. And I want to use this opportunity to put on record my call to see women being regarded as an economic growth sector in their own right, and I'd like to see the Scottish National Investment Bank having women's enterprise recognised as a key area for financial support. Another key focus should be on the creation of new markets, as has been mentioned by a few people already. And most obviously, renewable energy, which would demand patient capital to develop technologies for the future, which would overtake fossil fuel and lay down a pathway for engineering skills to transfer between the two energy sectors. And of course, as I've mentioned in my intervention to Kate Forbes, the loss of European structural funding with a pressing need to fund innovation. But this requires a long-term ter commitment and an expectation that returns will not be immediate. For example, I'd like to see finance being offered to allow existing companies to explore new markets. For example, oil and gas service companies be able to take out finance to invest in restructuring and retraining to access renewable energy contracts and perhaps work with universities to create groundbreaking technology which we can drive our economy forward and of course export throughout the world. In my area of the North East, there's a pressing need for diversification and innovation in order to make the area workforce less vulnerable to market changes and to retain talent in a geographical area. Many consultation respondents have made mention of regional targeting. This could be businesses wishing to operate in areas of Scotland which have a pressing need for investment, jobs, or are facing an economic shock could qualify for long-term patient capital support in order to bolster economic activity and make these areas attractive to new investors. Um, and many submissions also made a case for in infrastructure investment in regions facing economic issues. I also think the access to finance that the SNIB provides can bolster the efficacy of the Scottish Business Pledge. Access to their finance could be dependent on the applicant company signing up to and demonstrating compliance with the key areas of the Fair Work agendas on the pledge. Many of the discussions that we've had both in the Economy Committee and the cross-party group on women's enterprise have centred around the possibility of the Scottish National Investment Bank also potentially filling in the gap in the market that used to be offered by high street banks, particularly with regard to small and medium-sized enterprises. And there's a real opportunity to address the market failures in lending, particularly in the post-banking crisis, which is arguably limiting the growth, growth of our SMEs. Sub £1, one million pound loans could potentially have a great impact, particularly when it comes to enabling SMEs to service large contracts, which would also allow them to grow and internationalise. 
and the SME base arguably has the most potential for growth. But finally, I want to end on one significant aspect of the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, that, and that's that it will not be working for shareholders, but working for its stakeholders, and that's the people of Scotland. And, presiding officer, I think that's the main reason why people got to their feet that day when the First Minister announced its creation. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Richard Lyon. Deputy Presiding Officer, the urgent need for business support has been spelled out when the government's own analysis showed that SMEs in this country need up to £750 million more funding per year. But what is important are the resources themselves that actually support businesses and the economy rather than endless initiatives, agencies and bodies set up to essentially do very similar things. Because the creation of the Scottish National Investment Bank will incur running costs of between 20 and 30 million pounds per annum. While those figures are broadly comparable to banks of a similar nature, we need to remember the cluttered landscape of support that already exists in Scotland such as the Scottish Growth Scheme that has paid out just 5% of the funding that was promised two-thirds of the way into its three-year plan. The lack of clarity of focus, which the Fraser of Allender Institute pointed to in March, signifies that this SNP government is struggling to find the answers to its own difficult economic questions. Annual running costs, which arise through duplication, will simply eat into resources for business support. In recent weeks, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, we have been talking, taking evidence on the performance of the Scottish economy, and this has included discussions about the proposals for the Scottish National Investment Bank. Scottish Government Advisor Jim McCall talked us through a useful example of a bid he was involved in which would have built vessels for Irish ferries. Had a Scottish Government guarantee been provided for that project, it would have taken up much of the £340 million earmarked for the first few years of the bank. And with this Government's track record in actually delivering funding that has been promised in other schemes, we need clarity as to how this bank will fit into the enterprise landscape, deliver support and not waste money. Derek Mackay. I, I know the name, it was just the mic wasn't coming on quickly enough. Mr Linhurst, thank you for taking the intervention. Is the member though not aware that export guarantees are actually delivered by the UK government and maybe some pressure should be directed there to give a level playing field for shipbuilding industry and indeed many others where the UK government's taking their eye off the ball as they mismanage the Brexit chaos? Gordon Lindhurst. Um, well, I think on that point, we have the UK industrial strategy, which has the answer. But coming back to the Scottish situation, the point is, I think, what the, the Cabinet Secretary himself alluded to, how these things are done in other countries, such as Germany, where a plan is set out, it's uh, properly thought through, and then it is actually delivered. And that's what we're not seeing in Scotland, unfortunately, under this government. Witnesses attending our committee have told of the problem of the vacuum that exists when it comes to export finance, for example, and especially since the banking crash. The need to have government-backed patient capital that doesn't seek the quick wins <clears throat> that what has now become perhaps traditional bank lending does, but that has the potential to open up support to more businesses. That is to be welcomed. The implementation plan also points to the bank being used as a vehicle to pursue transformative change, such as supporting efforts to tackle climate change. And this following example, such as the German KFW, which issues support that reflects its three megatrends or grand challenges, one of which is climate change. However, what the government should be wary of is not to mirror some of the inflexibility that businesses have identified with the enterprise agencies. The bank should first and foremost be a support system in general that helps responsible companies access patient capital. In choosing where to invest, the SNIB and other sources of funding should analyze in detail how its support can contribute to business creation and growth where there is real potential, with other factors, environmental policies, workforce practices, and so on, supplementing that decision-making. 
analyzing where investment should be driven, should be done innovatively and dynamically, not just by a rigid checklist of business pledges that tie the hands of companies that are already doing the right things. A government ownership model may be the way to ensure patient capital, but the bank should be operated and decisions made by those with the experience needed. And to quote Jim McCall again, you do not want it to be managed by civil servants. So providing a structure but allowing decision making to take place independent of government is key to addressing some of the concerns about how the SNIB may be seen. Some political commentators have argued that the new bank and the amalgamation of existing schemes into it is a way of increasing political control over previously independent agencies. Owen Kelly, former head of Scottish financial, financial enterprise, warned, the structure proposed is effectively part of government, wholly owned by ministers and pursuing missions chosen by them, his words. Deputy Presiding Officer, today's debate has allowed us to delve into some of the detail and to analyse where the bank should fit within the wider enterprise landscape and the role of government. It is simply unacceptable that SNP economic incompetence is costing Scotland in areas such as GDP growth, productivity, exports and research and development to the tune of more than £80 billion of missed targets. Hopefully ministers will today listen to some of the concerns voiced here and also those whose experience could and can contribute towards the bank's potential for success. Yeah. Richard Lyle, followed by James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. Do you know, Mr Lindhurst, I think that uh, through you, President Officer, you should look at your own party's incompetence. Ambition, President Officer, ambition. That's the word that jumps to the fore as we debate this issue in the Chamber today. Ambition for Scotland, ambition for its economy, and ambition for its people. I welcome the publication of the Scottish National Investment Bank Implementation Plan as I consider it to be yet another milestone in our journey of delivering the environment to help Scotland achieve its full economic potential. And on that journey to realise our ambitions for Scotland's economy, we must ensure that innovative companies are supported to get access to strategic, affordable finance to grow and thrive, all the while ensuring the business environment, encouraging our young people to be entrepreneurs of not only the future, but right now. Not only will it help deliver these ambitions, but it will aim to provide and stimulate investment in order to create opportunities for Scotland by powering innovation and accelerating the transformation to a low-carbon, high-tech, global, competitive, and importantly, inclusive economy. I want, President Officer, to reflect more on the potential that the National Investment Bank has to support innovation and new enterprise, because it's an important area with many opportunities. For me, it singles a real opportunity to help potential new businesses who wish to bring new inventions and innovation to the fore. Innovation which is not getting the support needed from traditional banks. And I say that, of course, as a former employee of a well-known Scottish bank. Unlike that bank, I want this bank to listen and to lend. Examples of innovation that I see as having the potential to be supported by the National Investment Bank are ones that will help to deliver for our communities. I know of one organisation that wishes to bring new innovation and renewable energy, which will help local authorities reduce their power costs and contribute to, their, to the national grid. Do you know what? They can't secure bank funding, which totally astounds me. Examples such as these are the tip of the iceberg of the potential opportunities presented by a national investment bank. Of course, a national investment bank marks a step change recognises the work done so far by this SNP government to support business with growth potential and innovation is important and significant that we must go further. Our Scottish National Investment Bank has to take a new approach on capital investment. It must be innovative, supportive and lend. The commitment on the bank, which is part of the programme for government 2017-18, has been informed and part of the advice from the Council of Economic Advisers CEA. They've highlighted the important role which national investment banks play 
and in providing long-term investment to support economic growth in many European countries, including recognising the significant constraint faced by many businesses with growth potential and access to long-term patient, uh, patent capital. And as I've said already, whilst the Scottish Government have already taken steps to improve access to finance through, for example, the establishment of the Scottish Growth Scheme, there's more to be done. If we wish to succeed in raising our potential, our ambition and address the challenge, that's why now is the time to take a new approach on capital investment. And I believe there is a strong consensus in the timing being right, President Officer, a genuine shared belief that there is an immediate and pressing need for a creation of the bank. As so already it's been stated, it is clear that the economic and social well-being of our country will be enhanced by an institution that complements private sector investment with a clear focus on SMEs and projects that require strategic patient capital, patent capital. CEO of Tesco Bank, Benny Higgins, led the work on the development of the bank's governance and remit. Through his team, have undertaken rigorous analysis through the process and engaged an extensive and broad group of individuals and bodies in both public and private sectors. In order to inform this work, the University College London Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose was commissioned to produce a comprehensive report on all financial activities across the selection of international state investment banks, including Finland and Germany. The work undertaken by other nations across the continent should serve as an example of the potential that our bank, our bank has to generate and deliver a real chance to fulfil the potential for Scotland's economy. Whilst it's right that this debate naturally focuses squarely on our plans for a national investment bank, I wish to end my remarks today, President Officer, by recognising that these plans are one strand of our ambition for Scotland's economy and people. As we have seen through the 2018-19 budget, this SNP government is delivering significant investment for the Scottish economy by allocating additional spending in economy, jobs and fair work portfolio. From establishing a, a, building, Scottish build, a, building, a building Scotland fund to ambitious plans to deliver food, super fast broadband, etc., etc. I could go on, but unfortunately the Tories always do us down. This Scottish government, SNP government, has recognised we can continue to unlock Scotland's potential by investing in those that have a potential to grow and recognise the contribution that we've made. I think these plans are ambitious and essential, and I commend them, and I commend the work by the Cabinet Secretary and his ministers. Thank you. Can I say to all the remaining speakers that time is quite tight, and if people don't, as Mr Lyle just did, stick to just under six minutes, I'll have to cut the last speeches. So that would be James Kelly to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, members across the Chamber are right to talk about the benefits of a Scottish National Investment Bank uh, and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today. However, uh, Jackie Bailey is also correct to say that this is the ninth time we've had such an announcement and progress has indeed been slow. And listening carefully to the Cabinet Secretary, he tells us that it will be 2019 before we actually have the bill which uh, launches the, 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 the Scottish National Investment Bank. So the, the reality is that we're all likely to be back here uh, sometime next year for the government's very own version of 10 in a row. Um, and there can be no doubt... Yeah, that's something... That will give Murdo Fraser an opportunity to cheer on a ten in a row. Um, the, the, it, there's no... <laughs> yes, I'll do the intervention. Here we go. Derek Mackay. <laughs> I think it's best I move it on from football, uh, presiding officer. Um, can I ask then, on the chances of Labour seeing through their economic strategy, uh, that requires the election, as I understand it, of Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Uh, what year have Labour scheduled that in as part of your economic strategy? James Kelly. We would, we would welcome an, uh, an election as soon as possible, Mr Mackay. And as Jackie Bailey very competently outlined in her opening speech, that would deliver £40 billion of investment for a Scottish National Investment Bank. So that's something that the SNP should be uh, hoping to see uh, happen as well uh, as Scottish Labour. Um, but there's no doubt that 
Um, the, the, there, there is very much a place for a Scottish National Investment Bank. It's not just the growth figures that people have spoken about, 0.3% growth in the last quarter in Scotland compared with 1.1% in the UK, which would, should be a concern to all of us. But just look at the examples of the, some of the job, local jobs crises that we've seen across Scotland, uh, Bifab in Fife, um, Youngs down in Dumfries, and also Two Sisters in Cambus Lang. Uh, these, uh, these, these jobs crises are crying out for something like a Scottish National Investment Bank. I mean, in Cambus Lang, the closure of the Two Sisters plant will result in the loss of 450 jobs, and it's a real hammer blow for the local area. Uh, and what's needed there uh, is not just, uh, you know, words and sympathy for the workforce, but practical action, and that's something that a national investment bank uh, could, you know, could help to support. I think people are also right to, to talk about the capitalisation and the importance of the amount of money that's required here. Uh, I mean, £340 million, pounds, although welcome, I don't think really, really goes far enough. And I think there's a, a major job for the government as this develops uh, to look at how uh, more capital can be brought forward if we're really going to seize on the economic opportunities that many in the chamber have spoken about throughout the debate. I also think that it has to tie in properly uh, to uh, a coherent economic policy. Uh, many have spoken about the cluttered uh, economic policy landscape. Uh, the Fraser of Allender Institute analysis shows that the government have got 17 different strategies um, relating to, to the economy. And, you know, really that kind of demonstrates uh, the actions of a government that, you know, like to talk, like to bring groups together, uh, lots of meaningful words, but there's a lack of real action to move things forward. Um, and you can see that in the example of the, the growth scheme where only 31 businesses uh, have actually received help. I think what's also needed is to tie it into a proper industrial strategy. Um, Kate Forbes rightly spoke about the importance of innovation. Well, we heard last week from some, Sir Jim MacDonald of Strathclyde University on the chronic shortage there is in engineering skills. Uh, we're short of 400,000 engineers throughout the UK, um, but we know that there's also a, a, a quite a sizable shortage in Scotland. And part of the problem there is, uh, as the government acknowledged, there's not enough teachers uh, in STEM subjects and there's a lack of a thought out policy from schools through to uh, uh, colleges and universities and into, actual, uh, into the actual workplace as to how we're actually going to move people through and produce more uh, graduates that will fill these uh, skilled shortages. So uh, in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, certainly we all welcome the proposals for a Scottish National Investment Bank, but really... Um, it's time to get a move on with that. It's also time to look at how we can pull more money into it, tie it into a proper economic policy with a, an industrial strategy which has fairness and growth at the heart of it. I think, if, I think if these strands are included, there is a real opportunity for the Scottish economy. Call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the proposal to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank with a focus to provide long-term finance to support growth in the economy. A publicly owned National Investment Bank will act as a cornerstone for the economy with a capitalisation over the first 10 years of £2 billion pounds will focus on Scotland's economic priorities as well as promoting inclusive growth. Scotland needs this additional support as recent economic data has highlighted the slowdown across all of the UK economy as a result of Brexit and the Conservative government austerity measures impacting on government and household expenditure. We can see the evidence of this with the UK quarterly growth rate in the first quarter of this year collapsing to 0.1% and GDP per head falling by 0.1% over the same quarter. The OECD 
estimated that the UK economy will grow this year at a slower pace than any other major advanced or emerging nation. One reason for the poor growth is household spending, which has long been one of the drivers of the UK economy, with retail sales accounting for as much as 30% of domestic spending. Consumers are seeing their spending power drop as the slump in sterling followed Brexit referendum in 2016 has pushed up food prices with rising inflation and a decline in wage growth over recent years, resulting in many families struggling to make ends meet. In addition, the Chambers of Commerce have highlighted that until a transitional Brexit deal is in place, then companies will not increase spending due to the uncertainty and that this is impacting on staffing levels and production capacity. And the TUC, in a submission on the case for National Investment Bank, highlighted that companies were not investing due to uncertainty about the strength of the economy going forwards, exacerbated by austerity policies, shareholder short-termism, and the uncertainty around Brexit are doubling, are doubt, undoubtedly all playing a part. In 2016, the only OECD countries investing less than the UK were Greece and Portugal, with Ireland investing as a percentage of GDP double the UK investment level. The Patient Capital Review commissioned by the UK government highlighted that there are clear barriers in accessing long-term patient capital in the UK and that the majority of financing is concentrated in London and therefore it is particularly difficult for businesses outside the capital to access the funding they require. The Scottish National Investment Bank will help alleviate this situation by providing patient capital over a 10 to 15 year period to support companies to grow. This long term approach is important because the vast majority of companies in Scotland are SMEs with less than five employees. One of the key growth areas for Scotland is the new tech companies being set up with 440 software development and programming businesses being incorporated in 2017 and a 77% increase on the 249 companies set up in 2016. A Scottish National Investment Bank providing support to our growth sectors like fintech, life sciences, aerospace or renewables will... Yeah, carry on. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Gordon MacDonald. Uh, would he agree, he mentioned life sciences, would he agree with the Scottish Life Sciences Association about their strong concerns that Scotland is now the highest tax part of the UK and that this will impact the ability of their member companies, life science companies, to attract the right talent to Scotland? Gordon MacDonald. I think if any reasonable person looked at the whole policies across the gamut, whether it is um, free prescription, free tuition, everything, they would actually see that Scotland in the round is one of the lowest taxed parts of the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, Audit Scotland highlighted in its report into supporting Scotland's economic growth outlines the benefits. A buoyant economy creates employment opportunities. This increases people's wealth, leads to higher spending and stimulates demand for goods and service. This in turn means that business, businesses need to produce more, creating further employment opportunity, opportunities. Increased individual and business wealth also creates more money for public services such as healthcare and education, all of which leads to a higher quality of life for the people of Scotland. Growth will result in the Scottish National Investment Bank becoming self-sustaining in the long term raising its own capital and being positioned to provide long-term patient finance for both smaller firms and larger projects, creating the opportunities for new markets for the private sector to invest in. Am I getting my time back for intervention? No, yes? No. No, right, okay. I'll miss a bit then. <laughs> if we are to emulate the successful investment banks elsewhere, then in order to operate the bank, will require flexibility to hold reserves and carry these over between financial years out with existing limits set for the Scottish Government. As the implementation plan highlights, HM Treasury has already granted a similar dispensation to the Green Investment Bank prior to its re recent privatisation and to the British Business Bank. In addition, a similar arrangement is in place for Scottish Housing 
associations on a temporary basis while they are currently classified to the public sector. As the report states, without such dispensation, the bank would be unable to deliver the scale and ambition which is set out for it here, including through the adoption of a long-term patient investment strategy. Presiding officer, Scotland needs a national investment bank and all political parties should get behind this proposal to deliver for Scottish companies. The last two contributions in the open debate, Tom Mason to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. I first remind the chamber that I remain a City of Aberdeen councillor. Let me begin by acknowledging the announcement of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Just as I acknowledged its announcement in 2009, its re-announcements in 2013 and 2015, and the announcement and subsequent failure of the 2016 Scottish Growth Scheme. Presiding officer, I look forward to the bank's next announcement in six months' time. Those who know me know I was involved for some 20 years with the MBA programme at Aberdeen Business School of the Robert Gordon University. As you might know, many of the students who enter the MBA programme do so with the ambition to start their own business. To that end, I took part in negotiations many a time with various government agencies who were supportive of enterprise. Two things still stand out from these dialogues. Firstly, when looking to consult the government for help, students were inundated with so many barriers that they prevented their ideas from coming to fruition. You must remember that starting a business is an act of faith and not a rationality, as 95% of new business, business will fail. Secondly, on a number of occasions, I was att attended relevant sem seminars. And each time, the measure of success was the number of new businesses created in any one year, with no target of sustain sustainability. Good business requires a favorable environment, and attitudes which continually support and endorse the many acts of, of faith which new enterprises require. No matter how much rational business support is provided, if this environment is not available, new business will not be created or sustained. So what has this got to do with the proposed Scottish National Investment Bank? Well, as a Conservative, I, of course, endorse sensible long-term investment in, in our economy. However, there has to be a degree of purpose to investments, and I fear the bank will not yet, will be yet another big money facade for the government to hide behind. I suspect that the current barriers to successful entrepreneurial activity are only partially due to financial availability and more primarily to do with the negative business environment which pervades Scotland. If the government spent more time getting out of the way of businesses, allowing independence and prosperity in the business community, we might see more positive aspirations from a greater number of people. What's more, I'm not convinced the government will deliver to, on this proposal. The supposed 500 million Scottish growth scheme is yet to allocate a single penny in loans or guarantees. I think this can universally be seen as a failure. The bank will reportedly fill the gap in the SME market, providing finance up to 10 million in each firm. It will expand loan finances to SMEs between 100,000 and 2 million, and it will increase microfinance up to 100,000. Presiding officer, all these are already available through various other schemes. Even the bank's own implementation plan admitted that increasing funding for the Scottish Investment Bank could render this new plan unnecessary, a concerning conclusion. This is only added to the fact that the idea of the bank came from a pro-independence think tank. Presiding officer, I'm incidentally hesitant. If there's one thing we know about the wider Yes movement, it's that they are experts in exploiting blame from SNP onto anything that sticks to it. For example, the think tank suggested by the bank was needed due to the failure of our private financial sector. Maybe instead of blaming our businesses, we should, should instead look at government who controls and restricts their environment. On this basis, we should streamline the government's role in the economy. Funding yet another crank or task with the same duties held by others sounds irresponsible. Instead, let's start by reversing the tax decisions taken at the latest budget by encouraging business to both start up and grow in Scotland. Let's play to our strengths by encouraging consumption. We need to grow the economy, not tax it. 
I know my words fall on deaf ears. Sensible long-term planning is not the interest of the current Scottish Government. From pu public pay policy to capital borrowing decisions to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, after multiple parliamentary questions, admitted that the important future planning decisions are only taken on a year-by-year -year basis. So we're getting a new investment bank with no attempt to plan for the future and every attempt to spend it in the present. What a way to run a government, what a way to run an economy, and what a way to run a country. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from John Mason. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think there's clearly a range of issues in this debate that it seems we can all pretty well agree on. Uh, and looking through the recommendations, I sense agreement, for example, on number one, the very fact that a bank should be established. Two, it should help address Scotland's economic priorities in an inclusive and ethical way. Five, it should focus on being additional to finance already provided and complement rather than crowd out. Nine, we should build on current skills and experience. 17, there should be the highest standards of transparency, accountability and risk management, to mention but a few. So it's good uh, there is a lot we can agree on. But clearly there are going to be areas where we differ in this chamber and where folk outside will differ as well. The very term long-term patient finance is an interesting one. The market is not usually patient and many individuals are not very patient either. So I think many of us do admire what is apparently the German model, I think Gordon Lindhurst referred to that, of investors and local banks being committed for the longer term and prepared to take the downs along with the ups. Particularly, I admire the concept where shareholders are patient. When a takeover of a company is suggested and they say they are willing to wait longer for a return rather than sell out immediately for a short-term profit. And in this parliament too, Patience is not always evident. What was it used to say about patience? Seldom found in women, never in a man. People, people are waiting too long at A&E. Attainment gap has not been closed quickly enough. Exports are not growing fast enough. We say we want preventative spend to solve tomorrow's problems, but in practice, we demand reactive spend to solve today's. So I do wonder how we as politicians are going to cope with the concept of being more patient. If the new bank does not bring returns quickly enough, and recommendation six says measurement should be over at least a 10 to 15 year horizon, are opposition members committing to wait that long before they decide if a project has been successful or not? So one of my fears is that this bank could be undermined by its critics taking too short term a view. And actually, I wonder if 10 to 15 years is long term enough. That is really quite short term when you think of a house mortgage being 25 years and the actual life of the house might be at least double that. Recommendation 10 refers to aligning activities and members have already mentioned the British Business Bank. That is fine. I think we've heard some evidence at the Economy Committee that some Scottish businesses are not aware of the British Business Bank and that it is available to help them actually here in Scotland. So there's clearly a bit of work to do in getting information to people. Recommendation 11 says the bank should be a public body and should have maximum flexibility in how it invests. Fair enough. The point is also made that it will not require a banking license as it will not be a deposit taking institution. And I wonder if this is something that can be considered a bit more. I think Andy Whiteman was touching on this. Just on Friday, I attended a funeral and was asked by somebody if they would be able to invest in the SNIB, as they would be prepared to take a longer term view and potentially a lower return on their investment if they felt it was going to benefit Scotland's economy. So I think there may well be an appetite amongst the public for individuals investing in this kind of way. And I wonder if some vehicle can be found to allow that to happen. Recommendation 20 talks about staff with the right mix of skills and experience and also says remuneration terms which are sufficiently competitive. And I just wonder how that fits with recommendation 17, uh, talking about the highest standards of transparency and recommendation 2 that we must act in an inclusive and ethical way. Can there, can there and will there be a limit, for example, in the ratio between the top and the bottom paid staff within the bank? Does transparency mean that every salary level and every bonus will be published 
as they would be in most public sector bodies. Sticking to the ethical word, I wonder how easy it is going to be to agree on what, ethical, what is ethical and what is not. I might think investing in oil and gas is ethical, but my green colleagues over there might not. I might be happy that we continue farming and exporting salmon and cattle, while others might consider that unethical. And I think this could be a tricky area for us all to agree on. On more specifically economic issues too, I wonder if there would be pressure to bail out struggling companies if the public and others know there's a pot of money sitting there. James Kelly touched on this. For example, would Prestwick Airport receive investment? Would we expect to get that money back? Would the bank really be able to make its own decisions on that if there was pressure from the public and opposition MSPs? I note also the briefing from Friends of the Earth, and thanks to them for that, calling for example of investment for walking and cycling infrastructure. And I do wonder if that's the kind of thing the bank would actually do. How could they ever get a repayment or interest on something like that unless it is extra lending to a local authority? But local authorities are bound by prudential borrowing as to how much they can borrow. So in conclusion, I add my voice to those supporting this excellent concept of a Scottish National Investment Bank. Sure, there are some questions which need to be addressed. However, overall, I can say I'm enthusiastic about the idea and I look forward to it all being fleshed out in the months to come. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches and I call Andy Whiteman for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you <coughs> very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, as with some debates here, this has been a broadly uh, consensual debate, although politics has made its usual uh, interventions uh, now and again. Um, we agree, I think everyone has agreed so far, there's no dissent, uh, that the idea of a Scottish National Investment Bank is a good idea. Uh, but I think we are all agreed as well, a lot of work remains to be done to make it uh, both happen uh, and for it to be uh, effective. Um, I agree with Dean Lockhart that there are some areas that demand greater clarity in relationship to the cluttered landscape. And I think uh, there is work uh, for us all ahead to ensure that, I think what Alex Burnett referred to um, as uh, this not being uh, just an umbrella body for existing uh, initiatives. And I, I do share some of that uh, scepticism, but I'm prepared to give, at the moment anyway, the government the benefit of the doubt uh, on that. Uh, and this, clearly we need to scrutinise these plans very, very carefully over the next year or two. In fact, Kate Forbes herself conceded uh, that we have a cluttered landscape. That is a real concern. So I think, don't think there's anyone here, either on the government uh, side or the opposition, who's not alert uh, to that uh, fact. Um, and I'm sure my colleagues, uh, Gillian Martin, Dean Lockhart, John Mason, will be doing precisely that, paying close attention to this in the Economy uh, Committee. But whilst a cluttered landscape is a potential danger, so too are misleading statistics about the Scottish economy. And Dean Lockhart and uh, Alexander Burnett cited some so-called research published by the Scottish Tories today about an eight mil billion pounds lost to the Scottish economy. Uh, now, I look forward to debating these figures in future, but on a first glance, uh, the first two missed targets that are mentioned in the um, Tories' uh, research, so-called research today, relate to Scottish GDP, the same Scottish D GDP, but compared, um, compares the same Scottish GDP figures to two different points of comparison, the rest of the UK and small European Union countries. But given that's the same GDP, and it's, 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 it's compared to two different points of comparison, they're counting the sum twice. So I don't have much... Happy. Dean Lockhart. I, I would just uh, clarify with Andy Whiteman, the vast majority of that figure uh, was as a result of the failure to meet productivity targets. Uh, which the SFC, in terms of historical and going forward, has ident identified as one of the key uh, reasons why the Scottish economy is underperforming. Andy Whiteman. Well, that just further confuses matters because I think productivity is another one of the areas where they claim there's been um, lost uh, finance. So I think we need to uh, very much welcome Dean Lockhart if he wants to come back to me in the 80 billion with his uh, workings out. Uh, at the bottom would be very useful. Uh, Willie, Willie Rennie, who I, who I note, uh, oh, just walking into the chamber, um, mentioned and noted the need for the Scottish National Investment Bank to have a strong ethical investment policy, and indeed that plays a part in our amendment. I very much agree. 
um, and is an opportunity to promote the living wage and to invest in clean and ethical projects. I also agree with his comments uh, on salaries. He noted 90 institutions around the world, uh, state banks around the world, um, which is evidence that this idea can work. But if it is to work, then the mission has to be critical. Now, Claudia Beamish narrated the STUC's suggested uh, mission, which I very much broadly agree with, but it doesn't mention growth once. And that's reflecting the fact that this is, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, a redundant concept in the transition to a sustainable society living on a stable planet. So quite why Labour's amendment pays so much attention to that concept that's not mentioned once by the STUC and wh whose mission um, Labour promotes is, 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 is a mystery. And I repeat Professor Matsukatu's observations along with a wide range of other economists such as Kate Rayworth that GDP and the fetishization of growth is the economics of the past and not the future. I will. Jackie Bailey, at least recognise that the economy is currently stagnating. Um, that's not good for business. It's not good for wages. Um, is he saying that growth is not desirable at all? Andy Whiteman. What I'm saying is the way in which we measure growth, the way in which we measure the very stagnation that uh, Jackie Bailey uh, mentioned is highly flawed. It includes, for example, financial transactions, which historically have never been part of growth and don't add anything uh, to economic uh, well-being. Uh, now, James Kelly also observed um, that next year there will be a, a, a bill and between now and then I, I would uh, urge the Scottish Government to build genuine cross-party consensus and support um, for what's going to be in that bill and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will share some emerging thinking on the content of the bill and indeed may consider consulting on an outline of a draft bill not only with other parties and other members but with external interests uh, such as the advisory group that helped Bernie uh, Higgins. Uh, Kate Forbes and Gordon MacDonald and Richard Lyle also discussed the potential of the, uh, the SNIB to support private companies with loans that are difficult to obtain from mainstream commercial lending. Now this actually highlights one of the key tensions in the political ambitions for this bank. This was also hinted at by James Kelly. In my view, the role of the Scottish National Investment Bank is not to provide conventional lending to conventional businesses as part of mainstream day-to-day -day business operations. And it's certainly not part of the role of the Scottish National Investment Bank to support companies such as Two Sisters that produce dead chickens with a history of appalling food standards. SNIB is a million miles from going anywhere near such a company. Now, many have mentioned in this debate as well the need for long-term patient capital. And John Mason summed up some of the challenges, I thought, very, very well. And that is the, has to be the key for this very distinctive institution. That's why Greens in their amendment have put forward ideas such as a payment service and a banking licence that are worth considering if the Scottish National Investment and please Bank conclude now. is to be bold and ambitious Thank as the you. government wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, in fairness to Mr Rennie, he was present throughout your speech, Mr Whiteman. Who would want to miss it? Um, I now uh, call Jackie Bailey, please, to close for Labour. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think it's been a useful debate, and I hope that the Cabinet Secretary does reflect on some of the contributions made. I think it is clear that there is support for the Scottish National Investment Bank right the way across the Chamber. Um, it is fair to say, I think, that we want it to succeed because our economy is in trouble. The Cabinet Secretary does always like to tell us that the fundamentals of the Scottish economy are all sound. And, presiding officer, I just regard this as breathtakingly complacent. I am absolutely convinced that his civil servants must hide the statistics from him, otherwise he would realise how hollow his words truly are. But there is much that we do agree on. The Cabinet Secretary talked about a focus on decarbonisation, transition to a low-carbon economy, an inclusive um, change and also on innovation and much more besides. These are positive areas on which we share a desire to focus. So too is the focus on helping SMEs to grow along with provision of long-term patient capital. But Ivan McKee is right to point out the opportunity. The opportunity to invest in particular sectors to help shape the economy and harness its potential. But he talked about this in the context of an industrial strategy. Unfortunately, the Scottish Government doesn't have an industrial strategy. As I said earlier, it hasn't even bothered to tartanise the UK industrial strategy, and its own economic strategy is so old, it hasn't taken any account of Brexit. Now, I hate the idea of Brexit, but I dislike the SNP simply posturing about it and doing nothing 
practically to help protect jobs and businesses. James Kelly was right to talk about the need to centre the bank in a coherent policy framework, but that is sadly missing. He also spoke about time. The bank won't be up and running until 2020, a shadow bank in 2019, but there is a need for urgency to help our economy grow now. So what will the Scottish Government do whilst we wait? Governance has been raised by a number of members, including Willie Rennie and Andy Whiteman, and I welcome the, 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 the fact that the bank will be established as a public body and that the board will be gender balanced. I would also welcome confirmation from the Cabinet Secretary that all investments will be equality impact assessed, because I think that will create a step change in the culture of investments. Let me agree very much with the points made by Gillian Martin about women's enterprise. There is huge untapped potential in this area for growth, but it is important that the Scottish Investment Bank understands the difficulties that women have in accessing finance and makes women-owned businesses a priority growth sector. It's something that we have asked for both in the Economy Committee and in this chamber before, and it's not something that has yet been delivered. So why the hold up? Gordon Lindhurst mentioned shipbuilding guarantees, and you know, whilst I don't want to intrude on um, an argument between the SNP and the Tories, let me say as gently as I can that there are only two mentions of shipbuilding in the UK industrial strategy, and one of them is in the bibliography at the back. Um, but the underlying point he makes actually is the right one, because shipbuilding matters to Scotland. And when Jim McCall, owner of Ferguson Shipyard and a member of the First Minister's Council of Economic Advisers, tells us that they are unable to bid for some work because of the hundreds of millions of pounds required as a guarantee, which, by the way, other countries find a way of doing, then surely we should be trying to help. People expect both their governments to work together in the interests of jobs, businesses and our economy. Can I also ask the Cabinet Secretary to address in his reply what discussions he's had with the UK Treasury and indeed the EU specifically about state aid rules? Because I think it's important that we understand the context in which the bank will operate given that state aid rules are there. Can I say again to John Mason, the whole chamber is patient. We show just how courteous and patient we are when we are listening very attentively to his contributions. Um, finally, presiding officer, let me say as gently as I can to the cabinet secretary. No more announcements, please. I'm growing old waiting for this investment bank. Thank you, I'll take that, I'll take that compliment. Um, Genuinely, we want you to get on with delivering the Scottish National Investment Bank. We on these benches will support you in doing so, but we absolutely need the government to be more ambitious and bolder in what they're trying to do, because our economy needs nothing less. Thank you very much. I call on Murdo Fraser to close the Conservatives. Six minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The uh, context for this debate, as we've heard throughout is the whole question of Scotland's economic uh, performance. Uh, and we learned today, following extensive reporting across a range of media outlets, uh, that the SNP have missed five key economic targets. Targets they set themselves, uh, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. A failure to match UK levels of economic growth, a failure to match economic growth in other small EU countries, a failure to increase exports, a failure to increase R&D spend, and a failure to improve productivity, a cumulative total loss of £80 billion. Pounds. Mr Whiteman. Andy Gosh. Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Mr Fraser, for taking that intervention. Um, whilst I accept on paper these are missed targets individually, does it accept that collectively they do not add up to an £80 billion loss to the economy? Murdo Fraser. Uh, oh, Mr Whiteman's wrong. Collectively they do add up to £80 billion. Pounds. That's the whole point. £80 billion is the cumulative total uh, of uh, the loss. I suggest to Mr Whiteman, who wants to read more, he reads our excellent press release, which contains detailed workings of how these figures are arrived at. And you'll no doubt be as delighted as I was to see how extensively reported they were today. Just goes to show what you can achieve, Deputy Protecting Officer, on a slow news day uh, on a hot bank holiday Monday. Now, even the Scottish Government acknowledge there are problems. The uh, SNB implementation plan uh, refers, and I quote directly, 
to Scotland's economic uh, weaknesses uh, mostly appearing to be getting worse. So there is an issue to be addressed. So we on these benches are open to all good ideas about growing uh, the economy. And as my uh, colleague Dean Lockhart set out earlier, we give a cautious welcome to the principle of the Scottish National Investment Bank, although there are more details that we await. Now, the Cabinet Secretary raised the issue of special dispensation from HM Treasury being uh, required to allow the bank to operate beyond the limits of the existing fiscal framework, uh, in effect to allow additional borrowing. And the implementation plan accepts that such dispensation is unlikely. I think it's important that we put on record that our qualified support for the bank as a concept should not be taken as an endorsement of a call for Treasury dispensation. Indeed, as the implementation plan makes clear, it may not be necessary, as there is already some flexibility under the fiscal framework. But we'd be happy to discuss these issues in more detail with the Cabinet Secretary if he requires. Now, this is a, a bank that has been a long time coming, as Jackie Bailey and Tom Mason acknowledged. It's not a new idea. We've heard about it over more than a decade. The economist Alf Young was writing about it in 2009, saying even then this wasn't a new idea. We hope it has greater success than the Scottish Growth Scheme, launched in September 2016, a half billion pound investment in the Scottish economy. We were told some 20 months later, Deputy Presiding Officer, only 25 million pounds has been allocated and none of that, as far as we know, actually spent. None actually spent, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Then we have the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Fund. No funding leveraged in nine months after its launch. And all we should forget that the vast majority uh, of uh, SNIB funding comes from financial transaction cash, which the Cabinet Secretary for Finance described when it was announced by the Treasury as a con. That money being put to good use, I'm sure he will reflect on his choice of language uh, in, in relation to that particular uh, initiative. Now, our amendment today, in the name of my colleague Dean Locker, focuses on this issue of a cluttered policy uh, landscape. The Fraser Allen Institute claimed in their uh, economic summary that came out just a few uh, weeks ago that the Scottish Government have lost clarity of focus and delivery, with a myriad of different strategies, advisory groups and bodies now cluttering the landscape. And they're quite right to do so. And I think we have to look at what the Scottish National Investment Bank is going to do and what current bodies are already doing. For example, it's, we, we, we hear that uh, SNIB will finance SMEs up to £10 million. But the Scottish Investment Bank does that already. We hear that SNIB is going to expand loan funding to SMEs of between £100,000 and £2 million. But the Scottish Investment Bank does that already. And we hear that uh, it's going to extend microfinance up to £100,000. But the SME Holding Fund does that already. So as Alex Burnett said, we need greater clarity around what exactly this new bank is going to do and what it's going to do to replace these existing initiatives and what's going to happen to them. I do have some sympathy, uh, presiding officer, with the Labour amendment. The, the issue I have with it is it talks about a comprehensive industrial strategy for Scotland. But we already have a UK industrial strategy and I would prefer the Scottish Government to be working as part of that rather than trying to devise something entirely different. In relation to the Green Amendment, I just think it's too prescriptive. I think it's trying too hard to tie the hands of what, what this investment bank will do. And indeed, when it talks about low carbon investment, we already have the Green Investment Bank in that space. And therefore, we need to avoid too much uh, duplication. Dean Lockhart raised quite fairly the question of running costs, up to £30 million a year on staff salaries. That's a lot of money to spend. And Willie Rennie made what I thought was a fair point about how we're going to pay these salaries, at what rate they'll be paid, how we'll scrutinise that. But we need to be careful we don't scare away good people from coming to work uh, in a public sector body where we're going to need uh, talent. And I think if you look at, for example, the Scottish Futures Trust, which does pay very high salaries, nevertheless, I think we get a good return for the people working for that body uh, as a result. So we need to strike the particular balance. Because this bank will fail if it is subject to undue political interference. It must be free to take risks and must make market judgments on investments. And I have some sympathy for the points made by John uh, Mason in this respect. After all, if we're going to tie the bank to making ethical investments, how are we going to agree 
on what is an ethical investment presiding officer. Just to say in conclusion, if I can, it's been a helpful Briefly, debate please. in fleshing out more detail. There are still issues to be resolved, but we need to grow our economy and we give this initiative our qualified support. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Keith Brown to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Eight minutes, please. Hey. This has been, I think, a, an interesting debate, presiding officer, although I think the consensus which everyone talks about might be a bit more illusory as we go on through the process. Uh, it's also a very timely debate. What's clear from members' contributions is, I think, how ambitious everyone is for the achievement of faster inclusive growth uh, on inclusive point, perhaps every except for the Conservatives. Uh, and also that is an ambition which I share. And a publicly owned investment bank will become a cornerstone of the economy we want to create in Scotland, and it has the potential to be truly transformative. And we've heard a unique feature of the bank is its mission-based approach to investment. And these missions set by ministers and informed by consultation will give Scotland the potential to demonstrate global leadership on uh, common challenges. And the bank is going to have to be bold and ambitious in its approach, as well as its financing and its governance. In terms of its scale, scope and adaptability, uh, the Scottish Government is committed to capitalising the bank with £2 billion over 10 years. And that scale is ambitious, but achievable, and it will be a level that can make a material difference to the supply of capital to the Scottish economy. Uh, the bank will act on a commercial basis and have a different approach to risk and reward compared with other financial institutions. If I could try and address some of the points raised uh, by members. First of all, when uh, Dean uh, Lockhart spoke, he asked... Uh, about which strategies, when he was asked, in fact, by Derek Mackay, which strategies should be ditched, he said inclusive growth. And that's an astounding uh, thing for someone to say. Um, but we now know which, uh, where the priorities of... Yes, I will. Dean Locker. I appreciate it. What I said, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, we've had this discussion in the Economy Committee, is that there is no settled definition of inclusive growth. Mm. And you have come to the committee time and time again with different definitions of what that means. And that is a good example of not only a cluttered landscape, but muddled thinking in the government's economic strategy. Cabinet Secretary. The fact remains, you were asked by Derek Mackay, uh, sorry, the member was asked by Derek Mackay which strategy you ditched in the first one. The only one you came to was inclusive growth. And I do wonder whether the Tories, when they formulate their economic policy, if they do it in a darkened room, because they're not allowed to acknowledge the UK government's role in the economy. They're not allowed to acknowledge Brexit. They're not allowed to acknowledge the changes in oil and gas figures. They're not allowed to acknowledge austerity or the cuts. What kind of economic policy can you possibly develop that ignores those things? But you do it routinely, with the exception, I think, of Gordon Lyndhurst, who did actually admit the heretical thought that the UK government might actually be active in the Scottish economy, although turned Gavin Brown's thoughts on his head when he said the major levers in the Scottish economy were exercised by the UK government. The confusion and Labour's thinking over this means they cannot possibly come up with a rational economic policy. They can come up with a press release, and they can usually guarantee it to get into certain newspapers quite easily. That doesn't mean make it make sense. I should also say Jackie Bailey made the point about uh, £20 billion um, and actually unlike um, the Conservatives who asked us to get rid of some strategies, she wanted us to create some more. The £20 billion I think was contingent upon, and this is a big if, if Labour win the next election and Jeremy Corbyn finds £200 billion to put into that economy. Now we've heard this before and I remember we shouldn't have had to uh, reissue the tender for the ScotRail contract because Labour was going to win in 2015 and it would obviate any need for it. So I'm not sure that we can actually, I'm, I'm not sure, I will do in just a second, I'm not sure we can actually have policy waiting on the idea of a Labour victory, not least given the pathetic performance in local elections and as an opposition at Westminster. Over to you, Jackie Bailey. Uh, Jackie Bailey. You see, this is a case of the Cabinet Secretary's true colours um, being on display because the SNP have form in this area. They're not interested in getting the additional funding coming to Scotland. Was it not indeed the case that one of your former leaders suggested that people in Scotland shouldn't vote Labour, they should perhaps vote Tory? Look at what you've left us with. Cabinet Secretary. Well, if you want to look at what we've left us, we can remember what the first, the last words rather, of the Labour Chief Secretary to the Treasury was, there is no money left. The last words of the last Labour government, that is what Labour has left us with. We also had a number of comments. Ivan McKee, I think, uh, talked very sensibly about autonomous vehicles and also the idea of an industrial hub, uh, a very interesting idea which should bear further examination. Uh, Alexander Burnett mentioned the Scottish Government is, um, as I've said, preeminent in the Scottish economy. That kind of admits the fact that the UK government might be involved as well. That's a kind of heretical thing to admit. Uh, Murdo Fraser, I think, uh, talked about a further uh, consultation, and I think that is important, and it will happen. We've said that will happen. It's obviously the case that the 
part of the process that we're at just now has had consultation to get to this stage, but there is much more that we should be consulting people with. Kate Forbes talked quite rightly about the Highlands and Islands, SMEs, the difficulty in the finding available uh, lending and especially patient capital. And also uh, Claudia Beamish mentioned regionality, and I would accept that. The bank has to be seen to be serving the whole of Scotland. And if there are gaps within the geography of Scotland, then it should be addressed by the bank. And just to say that in, compa in comparison with the UK government, where they've built an economy which is so unbalanced, the most unbalanced economy in the world in terms of the inequality within it, and the, in terms of the dominance of London to the exclusion of much of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We cannot replicate that failure uh, here in Scotland. Gordon Linhurst mentioned the running costs being too high, uh, what to do about uh, capitalisation, which he felt was too low. And I think there's a, an element of confusion that we've heard amongst the Conservatives as to what they want uh, this bank to do and how they want to do it. I think Murdo Fraser's latter comments about the need to attract the right people to the bank are very important. And I also think, as Murdo Fraser said, that John Mason raised a number of very good issues which are things which point to the tensions which will be here. There will be the demand to take action for sometimes managed decline in industries. There will be the demands from opposition politicians to make sure that action is taken on whatever the issue of the day is. But that stands in contrast to what we're setting the bank up to do in terms of patient capital and a long-term transformation of the Scottish economy. Those tensions uh, will exist. Uh, Tom Mason, of course, gave us a wee insight, a wee retrospective insight into the Tory ideologues of the 80s. So get out of the way, government. Don't touch Bifar, presumably. Don't touch the steel industry. Don't touch Ferguson's. You know, this would have made Frederick Hayek blush had he heard uh, some of the comments made and actually I just was watching the front bench of the Conservatives who were speaking all looking at their shoes desperate for their speech to be over with but it does give us an idea <laughs> does give us an idea I've already given away uh, a couple of times so it does give us an idea of course of how um, the Tory party in other parts uh, of the party tend to think so I think we've had also from uh, James Kelly made the big mistake of thinking that the only threat he should look to towards 10 in a row is the other side of Glasgow and I would caution him against that threats can come from unexpected places sometimes I would also say that the bank that we are going to establish is, um, is, is to be further discussed at the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee later this month. And part of that discussion will, of course, focus on our response to the implementation plan. So there is that opportunity for further discussion on these issues. And also a written update will be provided to the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, a key priority moving forward with engagement with Treasury around the additional year. That was mentioned. I'm not genuinely unsure as to what Murdo Fraser was saying about his approach and his party's approach to that. We're having constructive discussions with Treasury. It's about year-to-year -year flexibility, including carrying balances across. And perhaps there's a misunderstanding here. I would hate to think that that was a, uh, a precursor of a refusal of the Treasury to listen to the arguments which we have put to them. It seems an eminently sensible proposal. It's, been, it's not looking for more money. Uh, we are intended to spend our own money. And I'm happy to have that further discussion uh, with uh, Murdo Fraser if he in turn wants to have that discussion with me. Just very quickly on the amendments, I think as long as the Conservatives understand it cannot be the case that if there's clutter in the Scottish economy, and I accept that commentators have said that, that it can only be the responsibility of one government. So let's have a, a genuine approach to look at the issue uh, of clutter. And part of my proposals that I've already mentioned would try to address that by the incorporation within the new bank of some of the other functions which have been mentioned previously. So let's have that genuine discussion. Uh, in terms of the Greens, we obviously have some I'm difference afraid, with I'm the afraid Greens. you'll have to conclude, Cabinet Secretary. But a, a great deal in common. I'd like to discuss some of the issues further. We do support the idea of pre private capital being used. Very interested in the Scottish payment company, but can't support the amendments for the reasons mentioned. And we can't support the uh, amendment from the, the Labour Party, not least in terms of capitalisation. All in all, though, I think there's a great deal which we can unite around here. If there's a genuine hope for uh, consensus, then I'm determined to try and achieve that through further discussions through the committees and in the Parliament. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes the debate on Scottish National Investment Bank. And before we move on to next night of business, I know my colleague in the chair has reminded members yet again not to use the term you of individual members. It can be used of a collective group like Conservatives or Labour or Scottish National Party or Green, but not individual members. Train yourselves, please.